Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. This is Glossy Philosophy. My name is Jansen Finman and today you are tuned in for a book talk. Today's book talk we are discussing Tracy Borman's Thomas Cromwell biography. This has been one of those books following Lil Paul that has just been like haunting me for a year and I'm so excited to talk to you guys about it and get you excited about Thomas Cromwell and if Lil Paul is really true or if it's somewhere in between or completely ridiculous. So let's get started. Tracy Borman, who's the author, she is the joint chief curator of the Royal Palaces in England and she's the chief executive of the Heritage Education Trust. So she's also written a bunch of other books on the kind of Tudor era and some other historical things as well. So she knows her stuff, okay? And in the beginning, it's either in the beginning or the end when she just makes a note that if Hilary Mantel hadn't written Wolf Hall, she never would have gone and researched Thomas Cromwell. So thank you, Hilary Mantel, and thank you, Tracy Borman, for digging in and giving us the actual historic what happened as best as we can. Who is this guy? All right. If you notice, on a lot of the editions of Wolf Hall and definitely on the biography of Thomas Cromwell, we have the portrait, the first portrait of Thomas Cromwell, like ever created by Hans Holbeam, who was like the portrait painter at that time. So just looking at this guy without even reading, we're kind of maybe taken aback by his focus in his eyes and just like the set of his mouth, like this guy seems serious, maybe even trouble. I don't know about him, wouldn't want to meet him on a street corner at night kind of thing. And Tracy Borman does such a great job of breaking down his beginning, his rise, and everything in between, and then of course his fall. So spoiler alert, if you don't know anything about Thomas Cromwell, it doesn't end well for him. He has an amazing ride in the Henry VIII court. He like gets as high as he possibly can and then he completely falls and loses his life. So let's start at the beginning. Thomas Cromwell, just like in Wolf Hall, does come from a poor family. His father is a blacksmith, among other things. His father also makes alcohol and gets in trouble a lot of the time for watering it down too much below the regulated percentage. He just, we don't know if he was as abusive as he is in Wolf Hall, but it seems like because he's in trouble with the law, I can definitely see where Hillary Mantel created that very abusive mentally and physically physical character. We also know that at some point Thomas Cromwell, it's not really understood if he runs away or he just leaves. At some point he leaves his home and he travels abroad. He is basically a soldier for hire and finally gets hooked up with the financial district in Italy and changes his life around completely. So Thomas Cromwell is one of those guys who is just brilliant. Not only can he remember things, but he has this incredible work capacity to take on like 20 different jobs and just make it seamless and easy. He's great at business. He's great at the law because, oh yeah, by the way, not only is he awesome at finance, he also becomes a lawyer and he's just so brilliant. He also is very well read. So here's a guy, blacksmith's son. That's like one of the lowest things you can be during the Renaissance, during the time of Henry VIII. And like nobody would have looked at him and thought that guy is going to become like the guy in England right underneath the king. So it is incredible. It is truly a story of dragging yourself up by your bootstraps and getting all the way to the top without basically becoming king. And then unfortunately he has a few missteps and 
loses his life. So by the time history really starts paying attention to Thomas Cromwell, we know that he is also working for Cardinal Wolsey. Before the rise of Thomas Cromwell, Cardinal Wolsey is the guy. He's basically running England while Henry is doing whatever he's doing. He's hunting, he's having affairs, he's married, but he can't have a son. He doesn't know what to do. Cardinal Wolsey is running things and making sure that there's peace as much as possible. Um, he's doing all this uh, delegation. He is talking to everybody over in Western Europe and making sure that England is okay with everyone because Western Europe at this time is a hot mess. And then comes the downfall of Cardinal Wolsey because Henry can't have a son with his queen, Catherine of Aragon. They're just, it's not working for whatever reason we don't really know. So they can't have a son. Henry VIII freaks out, starts looking around, finds Anne Boleyn, who is just back from the French court, catches his eye, and they start this really intense, obsessive courtship with one another and Henry, especially on Henry's side, he just can't stop thinking about her. He just needs Anne in his life all the time. So much so that as the Cardinal is losing his esteem in Henry's eyes, Anne gets his ginormous palace to live now. She gets several new titles. Her family becomes super wealthy. And eventually, Catherine of Aragon gets kicked out of the palace and Anne gets rooms right next to the king. So this is serious. However, Anne has said that she will not sleep with Henry and, like, give him children until she becomes Queen of England. Cardinal Wolsey is like, I can't do it, man. I'm trying so hard, but I just, it's not happening fast enough. And it seems like Cardinal Wolsey isn't taking it seriously enough. So Cardinal Wolsey loses his life. Thomas Cromwell at this time is like Cardinal Wolsey's right-hand man. So as Cardinal Wolsey is descending into not a good place, then Thomas Cromwell, like, breaks away from his master is what they call it and then he starts kind of feeling things out in court like hey I'm a really smart guy maybe I can help you and then he comes up with the ability to solve the king's problem he can give the king a divorce if he can prove that Catherine of Aragon is wasn't actually a virgin when she married the king so he comes up with all these things and it it's just really crazy. And he gets the king a divorce. The king is free to marry Anne. Anne weds the king. They have Elizabeth, who will eventually become queen and, you know, do an amazing job. And, but Anne is also not able to have a son. So Henry starts wandering again. This whole time, Thomas Cromwell is just climbing that ladder. And at some points, he's friends with the Queen, with Queen Anne, and at some times, he's not. He is definitely the reason behind her epic downfall and her beheading. He gets the job done when he needs to. So we have this really interesting picture of Thomas Cromwell through history that's always been like he's such a bad guy he he's ruthless he doesn't do anything good but that as it turns out is not true 100 percent not all the truth anyways did he do some bad things yeah was he the guy that was responsible for Anne Boleyn's downfall yes and no Anne was also responsible for her down Fall, and I don't mean like her fertility stuff. It's some other things that she did, but he absolutely took it to the next level and was in charge of like getting her beheaded so that the king could now marry someone else. Oh, and by the way, all this is happening within a span of like six years. Just so crazy. 
Okay, so Thomas Cromwell, who is this guy? Who is this guy who can figure out how to get the initial divorce, who can figure out how to get another divorce and behead a queen of England? That's never been done before. And have another marriage, and he's going to go through another marriage with Henry after Jane Seymour. If your head is spinning right now with all of the wives that Henry VIII is having, tell me about it. Six wives. It's insane. So this is Thomas Cromwell, right? He's getting all these things done. Not only is he responsible for the crazy love life of the king, he's also responsible for basically everything else. When I said that he could do 20 jobs, he does. And at one point, his household grows so much. And by household, I mean like all his workers and all of his apprentices. He has like like over a hundred people working for him underneath him. And he has this massive, massive house. He is one of the wealthiest guys in England. And if you haven't remembered, he does not come from nobility. He does not come from money. He is a blacksmith's son. Everyone who is nobility is looking at this guy and thinking, I don't like this. This is making me feel very nervous, and I don't like that I'm taking orders from a blacksmith's son. So that is something that you'll hear over and over and over again, not only in the Wolf Hall series, but also in the biography. It is this constant class struggle between, it's not even the bourgeoisie, it's just like the old, old nobility versus Cromwell. So he's fighting that the entire time he is gaining power and gaining traction. And eventually that is one of the reasons why he has an epic downfall is because the nobility are like, enough, you're going to the tower and you're going to be beheaded and we're just going to move on. You've become too powerful. And they convince Henry that he wants to be king and he's actually trying to maneuver his way into kingship by all the amazing things that he's able to do for England. So we have that, okay? And then we also have Thomas Cromwell as like this incredible lawmaker. He makes so many reforms for England and in all of those reforms, he also, I don't know, changes the religion of England. What? That is amazing. So over in Western Europe, we've got Luther, who's like tacking his stuff on the door and saying like, no more praying to the saints, no more like Pope, you're gone. All this stuff that is very like non-Catholic, which is what... Western Europe and England is supposed to be where they're supposed to be like, yes, Pope, yes, statues, yes, saints, yes, 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 to all these things. Luther says no. So these ideas start to trickle. Thomas Cromwell is also, in, I don't want to say infected, he is moved by these ideas of like, not quite anti-Catholicism, but like a reform, a reform of the Catholic Church. And he really, really wants the people of England to be able to read the Bible for themselves in English. If you're like, wait a minute, wasn't the Bible always in English? No, my friends, it was not. <laughs> it was in Latin for a very, very long time, as well as other languages. But when we are in this time during the Renaissance, or the Renaissance, Luther says it's really important that you're able to read it for yourself in your own natural tongue. So we've got all of these reformists who are starting to look at the Bible and translate it, which gets a little tricky, right? Because what if you don't like this guy who's translating it? Do you know if he's translating it correctly? So you have to read like all these Bibles and see which one you like. It becomes illegal in England for a long time to have an English Bible because they don't want everybody to read the Bible. They don't want them to have that information and to think for themselves. If this is sounding kind of George Orwellian, it is. It's really bananas. Even Cardinal Wolsey has moments when he will just burn books because he's afraid and he's of the old thinking that people 
like you and me should not be reading on our own. We should not be thinking on our own. We don't have that brain capacity. Thomas Cromwell is like, no, everybody should have a chance to decide for themselves if they believe these things or if not. If they do, that's cool. If they don't, that's cool. So he's a huge reformist, but he does it like really secretly. And by the end of his like reign, he has changed England forever, along with the help of Anne Boleyn, because Anne Boleyn is also a huge reformer, which is another reason why she got her head cut off. Okay, so it's not just that she couldn't have a son with Henry, it's also because she was a huge reformer and people just really didn't like her because she took over Queen Catherine's position and they were not happy about that. So Anne gets like the black book, unfortunately. We don't really know that much about her. Thomas Cromwell, what do we actually know about him is so hard because we have all these letters. He just wrote letters like a madman just getting all the things done that he needed to get done. And we have a, a lot of those letters, but in a lot of them, they're very like, like, oh, I'm such a, a lowly blacksmith son. And, you know, I wouldn't dare to give you advice, but this is what I'm thinking and all this stuff. And then you see how powerful he is and it doesn't quite match up. And then the tone of his letters do change a little bit, and he does write to the king, and we have some of those letters. But we also find out from other people's accounts of him that not only was he, again, taking care of Henry's love life, changing the world of England lawfully and religiously, but then you have, like, Thomas Cromwell, the guy, who his neighbor, Chabri, who is very integral in Thomas Cromwell's story and also in the court life of Henry VIII says like there's always 200 poor people outside of Thomas Cromwell's house that he feeds every day. He gives a lot of money to the city. He gives a lot of money to the poor. He's like a champion of um, of women, especially widows, and he doesn't seem to have more than one illegitimate child, which is shocking compared to how court life was way back when. So who was this guy? Even after reading this, it's still just a little bit of an enigma to me because we have, again, we have all these letters that he's written in his own words, but as you read them, because um, Tracy Borman does put as much as she possibly can, unless it gets very old English and you couldn't possibly understand it without having studied old English. But she puts some of his letters in there and you're just like, who is this guy? It's really hard to decipher. So I applaud Tracy Borman for like figuring it out and putting the story together. But even she says, like, there's still a lot that's unknown and there's still so many gaps because a lot of what we know about Thomas Cromwell outside of his letters is from, like, Chapuis and other characters that are in his life, and but they're telling their version of him and we don't, I never really feel like we get Thomas Cromwell's actual story. And it just makes me think if people only looked at like my blog and maybe my bank accounts and my charitable donations, what would they think of me if I didn't have a chance to voice my own thoughts and opinions? What would history say about me or about any of us? just by looking at a few little details and then gathering in information from other people that may or may not be true or may not be the whole story. So it's so interesting how we put all these puzzle pieces together to create this idea of who this guy was. Something else that I've just been thinking about so much is Anne Boleyn, because Anne Boleyn plays such a major, major role 
in the life of Thomas Cromwell. Sometimes they're friends, sometimes they're frenemies, and then at the end they are outright enemies. But again, it's so hard. I just feel like Anne gets you know, the slap in the face every single time, except maybe in the movie Anne of a Thousand Days. <laughs> and she definitely is the villain in Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies, which we're covering very soon. She's a little bit of a villain in the biography, but here's the thing. We don't know that much about her. We don't really have very much in her own words. Again, we're getting a lot of this information from other people who don't like her. And even for a while, there was a lot of information saying that she had a sick finger, that she was a witch, that she wasn't beautiful at all. And then Elizabeth, when Elizabeth becomes queen, she is the one who commissions like a, a portrait of her mother, but her mother's already gone. And it's just like, we still don't really know who she was. Almost. Like, do we really know who Thomas Cromwell is? So again, it's just something to think about. Like, what would history say about you with just a few puzzle pieces and trying to complete the whole person? It's very tricky. And it does kind of make you think about what you're leaving behind as you know, like your legacy, if that is important to you. But I know I definitely think about that myself. How do I want to be remembered? What do I want history to say about me in obviously a very small way, but like, where am I giving my money to? And just, you know, things like that. How am I spending my time? Who am I spending my time with? It just, it just makes you think. I, and even though Thomas Cromwell did some not nice things and definitely partook in some violence of the Renaissance, I greatly appreciate his work ethic and I really admire how he had such a big goal for England and he made it happen and he didn't at times he 100% like threw everybody in the deep end and was like this is the way it's going to be but a lot of the time he just took his time and made small changes and then all of a sudden oh hey we're not really Catholic anymore. Or, you know, he funded Bibles to be written in English so that all the churches in England would have at least one copy of an English Bible. And I think that's just incredible that he had that foresight. He's also the guy who said, hey, everybody should know who their mom and their dad were, no matter what their position was. And when people get baptized, we need to start writing this down. On one hand, they say that that was so that they could collect the correct amount of taxes on villages and people. But on the other hand, it's also a way for you to just know where you come from because all the nobility, they can name off, you know, until the beginning of time where they come from and who their great, great, great grandfather was and what they did and you know all those bloodlines but the everyday person had no idea and it was a way to say like I belong here and you know I pay taxes too I'm part of this country so I just think that's a really lovely thing that he did for whatever reason he did it whether it's for money or a little bit of that you know nostalgia but I think that was a really interesting thing. And I also love that he gave so much back to the poor and so much to the city. I think that's really admirable. He didn't just keep all of this money for himself. His old master, Cardinal Wolsey, just really was into the pomp and that got him in trouble. And I don't know if that's why he made sure that he was like, he was wealthy, but he always made sure that he took care of others or if that was just part of his natural like who he was but I think that's really admirable and something to keep in mind that no matter how fortunate we are we need to give back so would I recommend this 100% it is an incredible biography the only thing that's possibly going to bug you are the letters that Tracy Borman puts in here in his own writing 
because old English is so different <laughs> from English today. And even some of the letters are like the alphabetic letters that they put in there is not how we spell things. So sometimes that gets a little distracting. And I did find myself skipping quite a bit of those letters to the king from Thomas Cromwell, especially at the end when he's in the tower. I just like, it's too flowery. It's too old English. I just was like, okay, Tracy Foreman, just wrap it up for me. Tell me. But I also like that she put it in there in case I ever do want to read his actual words. I think that's nice. It's just a nice like topping for her to say like, this is not just what I think about Thomas Cromwell. You read it and you see what you think about kind of like how Thomas Cromwell made the English Bible possible for everybody. So it's just kind of a nice tie into his life as well. And I think the history is fascinating. I think he's really interesting. I definitely think more information and research needs to be done on him just to create a better all-around picture of who he was. And I'm sure different authors have different things, but Tracy Borman did a fantastic job. And I've already given this book to at least one other person and will probably gift it to others. So I definitely recommend it. And that is the book talk. Thank you guys so much for watching this book talk. I really love the story of Thomas Cromwell and just the idea of who was this guy who rose from being a blacksmith's son all the way to basically ruling England without becoming the king. It is truly fascinating, inspiring at times, and just like heart-wrenching at other times. And it's just a tale of a real person instead of like a hero or someone fictional like this is real life, a real person did all these incredible and awful things. It's just really interesting. So highly recommend. Normally I do fashion videos every Wednesday, beauty videos on Fridays, and of course the more in-depth details on Mondays. So thank you again for watching. Hit the thumbs up and the subscribe and I'll see you very soon. Bye.